Life is all about choices. In the NFL, decisions make or break you as a coach. If you get it right, you look like a genius. If you get it wrong, you're packing up your belongings on Monday. In some cases, good play calling may not be able to overcome a lack of talent or vice versa. But there are situations that come up in football where simply the decision, the choices a coach makes comes down to him and him alone. I'm not talking about running the ball on first down versus passing or a screen on a third and 25. I'm talking about moments where the game is in the balance and a conscious decision determines the outcome of the contest. Today, we're going to examine the fascinating math around all of these play calling dilemmas and what the numbers say when it comes to getting it right or getting it dead wrong and find out if our coaches know what the hell they are doing. And all that's coming up right after this. I get it, fall is pretty, but you know what's not pretty? The colder weather, and that means not wanting to leave the house. And not leaving the house means you don't wanna go grocery shopping. Well, what if I told you there is a way to have chef curated, delicious, time-saving meals delivered right to your door, all while saving up to 30% on grocery shopping? Yep, it's HelloFresh, the sustainable way to cut out the stress of meal planning, all without having to venture out into an ever colder world. I've endorsed this product for a long time now, and I can tell you, I've experienced all these benefits. No cap. Yes, I just said no cap. Look at all the meals I have cooked, like these bean tacos, and they always deliver. HelloFresh is easy to prep, tasty, and has less wasted food. So after this video, head on over to HelloFresh.com and use code 5points14 from the link below and get up to 14 free meals across your first five HelloFresh boxes. Again, that's HelloFresh.com and use my code 5points14 for 14 free meals. You're gonna fall in love with HelloFresh. Through the first five games of this NFL season, the Los Angeles Chargers were seven for seven on fourth down conversions, including a number of bold calls from inside their own territory to extend drives. The Chargers understand that they have four downs and they don't like wasting one of them, either punting the ball away or trading seven points for three. It turns out the math is on their side. And to explain that, we have to explain something called expected point value. Expected point value refers to the number of points a team can be expected to score on any given play, taking into consideration the down, distance, and their position on the field. The closer you get to the opponent's end zone, the greater your expected points. If you keep going backwards towards your own goal line, your expected points can dip below zero because your opponent becomes more likely to score than you are. Easy math, right? With expected points though, keep in mind that there is a calculation based on simply taking the risk versus the actual outcome. You'll see what I mean. Okay, back to the topic. When you're talking about fourth down, you have to make the following calculation. You must add the expected points from a successful conversion, a positive number, plus the expected points from a failed conversion, a negative number. For instance, fourth down and one from your opponent's 10 yard line creates an expected point value of 3.24. If the expected points integer of a successful conversion is greater than the expected points integer of a failed conversion, then the math would suggest nutting up and going for it. Basically, there's a sliding scale according to the New York Times fourth down bot. If you're faced with fourth and one, you should go for it anywhere past your own eight yard line. Fourth and two, go for it anywhere past your 28 yard line. Fourth and three, go for it anywhere past your 40 yard line. The closer you are to your opponent's goal line, the more aggressive you should get on fourth down until the expected point value of kicking a field goal becomes greater than the expected point value of going for it on fourth down. And when you're around midfield, your options open up. You can go for it, you can kick a field goal, or you can be spineless and go for a punt. We'll get to punting in a little bit, but here's another dilemma. Going for it on fourth down versus taking the points and kicking a field goal. The closer you get to the goal line, and unless you are the Vikings, the more likely it is that a kicker will make a field goal and the expected points go up because even if a kicker misses a short field goal, the opposing offense will have a longer field ahead of them. 
What does the math say? According to expected point value, it's actually better to go for it on fourth down and nine or shorter than it is to kick a 55 yard field goal based on the average success rate for an NFL kicker. This does depend on who your kicker is. Let's say Justin Tucker makes 70% of his field goals from 55 yards out. You would take the percentage Tucker makes the field goal, 70% or 0.7, times the expected points of a made field goal, which is 2.5 points. Then you have to add the chances of a miss times the expected point value of giving the other team the ball at the 45 yard line, which would be 30% times an expected point value of negative 1.8. Is this confusing? Let me show you. 0.7 times 2.5 equals 1.75 points. Okay, that's one part of it. Now we factor in the chance of a miss. 0.3 times negative 1.8, which equals negative 1.5 points. Now we add the two, which equals 0.25 positive expected points added. That means the net value of simply attempting a 55 yard field goal with Justin Tucker is plus 0.25 and will add to your likelihood of winning the game, meaning it's an acceptable risk. But replace Tucker with a lesser field goal kicker, <coughs> Cody Parkey, and the risk outweighs the reward. Let's say you decide to keep Tucker on the sideline and go for it on fourth and nine rather than kick the field goal. Is this the better option? Convert and get the ball to the 28. You get an expected point value of roughly 3.5 fail and your opponent gets the ball at the 38 yard line which is minus 1.31 points to you 0.35 times 3.5 equals 1.23 for a conversion and 0.65 times negative 1.31 equals minus 85 for a miss and you add them up 1.23 plus negative 0.85 and you get 0.38 expected points if you simply go for it if you don't care about the math let me make it easy. Like I said before, it means that it's actually better to go for it on fourth and nine than it is to kick a 55 yard field goal. Believe it or not. Wow, take the points crew is big mad right now. So as a fan, when you're urging your team to go for it, unless it's ridiculous, the math says you're right. Let's talk about the most exciting play in football. In the 2020 playoffs, Mike Vrabel was faced with a situation that appeared to be fairly straightforward. His Titans had fourth and two at the Ravens 40 yard line, 10 minutes and six seconds left on the clock with Tennessee trailing 13 to 17 in the fourth quarter. Given everything we learned in the last segment about going for it on fourth down, the choice seems obvious, especially with an offense as efficient as Tennessee's was in 2020 and one of the greatest power backs in NFL history at their disposal. That's not how Mike Vrabel saw it. Instead, he chose to do the most spineless thing an NFL coach has ever done. And the math agrees with me. Welcome to the Surrender Index, a tool invented by the mind of John Boyce, football genius and noted mathematician. The Surrender Index combines five different elements, the score, the spot, the down, the distance, and time left in the game to determine just how cowardly it is to call a punt in that given situation. Call it conservative, call it trusting your defense, call it Marty Ball, whatever it is. And as you suspect, punting inside enemy territory is definitively not how you win games in the NFL. For example, if the offense has the ball on the opposing team's 38 yard line, fourth down and four yards to go, down 11 points with 346 left in the fourth quarter, the surrender index would give that a value of 67.98. If we change the distance from fourth and four to fourth and one, suddenly the surrender index spits out a value of 113.31. That's bad. Cut the time remaining from 3.46 to two minutes, and suddenly the surrender index increases that number to 132.78. That's unthinkable cowardice. Let's go back to the situation I talked about earlier and what I like to call the assassination of the 2020 Titans by Mike Vrabel. Instead of sending out the offense, Mike Mike trotted out the punting team. Brett Kern booted a 25 yard punt that was fair caught by Devin DuVernay at his own 15 yard line. So rather than taking a chance to go for the lead, 
Mike Vrabel opted for 25 yards on field position instead. The odds of converting a fourth and two in that situation was 61%. And again, if we do the math, first we can figure out how many expected points Tennessee would have added. A two yard conversion on fourth and two would place the ball at the 38 yard line with a fresh set of downs, which carries an expected points value of roughly 3.1. Here's the math. Success rate, 0.65 times expected point value, 3.1, equals 2.02. Then add the failure rate of 0.35 times expected point value. If the Ravens get the ball at Tennessee's 40 yard line, minus 2.03, which equals minus 0.71. 2.2 plus minus 0.71 equals plus 1.31 simply for going for it. Essentially, by punting on fourth and two from the 40 yard line, Vrabel also punted on 1.31 expected points added. Instead, Vrabel got nailed with a surrender index value of 138.87 ranking in the 100th percentile of cowardly punts of the 2020 season and the 99.92nd percentile of all punts since 2009. It was not only the wrong decision, but given that the Titans lost, it was one of the most spineless punts ever with the season on the line. Oh, guess what? Tennessee didn't cross midfield for the rest of the game. In terms of surrender, it was a 50-foot white flag flown at full mast and a rolled-out red carpet placed on the ground for Baltimore to safely advance to the next round of the playoffs. How did Vrabel attempt to acquit himself after the game? No, just decided to punt. Thought we were playing well defensively, thought we would get a, get a punt inside of 10 and you know, be able to play the field position game. Had some time there that I felt like, you know, we could. And, we can take into account that Derrick Henry was averaging just 2.2 yards per attempt in that game, which was probably Vrabel's rationale for not keeping the offense out there. But for a head coach that said he would cut his penis off for a Super Bowl victory, that's a pretty neutered decision and one of the biggest moments of the season. But let's move on to a different situation. It's the end of the game. You're down three points. The ball is at the 45 yard line and there's only time on the clock for one more play. Here's the dilemma. Do you attempt a Hail Mary or kick a 62 yard field goal and tie it and try to win it in overtime? Hold on. You might be asking yourself a question. Why is the ball at the 45 yard line in this hypothetical? That feels a little specific. Good question. That's because according to Four Verts Football, the average Hail Mary play begins at the 44.7 yard line. To no one's surprise, that's also close to where they usually draw that red line on the field during the broadcast. Thus, the dilemma begins. What are your chances that your Hail Mary will be answered and you win the game right away? About 9.7% according to ESPN stats and info. A little higher than you might have thought. Not so much a wing and a prayer as it is a realistic possibility. And if your quarterback is Aaron Rodgers, you might even expect it to work. Luckily, this isn't a particularly complicated math problem. In fact, it's about as simple as it gets. If you have the choice between a 62 yard field goal and a Hail Mary, you trot out the kicker. With a 28.5% chance the 62 yarder will sail through the uprights, your chances are about three times better you kick. But when you take the field goal chances into account, those have to be cut in half because your chances of winning in overtime are a coin flip, 50-50. So if we do the simple adjustment, 28.5% divided by two is 14.25, which is still greater than the 9.7% chance that you complete a Hail Mary for a touchdown. Easy decision, you say? Not so fast. Why is that? It's because there just aren't enough 60 plus yard field goals that get attempted in the first place. So we have a small sample size on that kick success rate. Plus the data we do have is likely skewed by the fact that coaches aren't trotting out the Cody Parkies and Nathan Badgley's of the world to attempt those long kicks. They're sending out the Justin Tuckers, Brandon McManuses, and even Mason Crosby's of the world. 
So the 28% isn't representative of all kickers. It's only representative of the kickers who have 60 plus yard range. Still, given the data that is available, it's probably best to send out the kicker. But again, not as clear as you think. This is where you begin to realize that the math can't do all the heavy lifting and the head coach still has to earn his paycheck on those big decisions. And speaking of big decisions, our last dilemma. Here's a hypothetical situation. Your team is trailing by 14 points in the fourth quarter. After driving down the field, your guys put the ball in the end zone, making it an eight point game prior to the extra point. The decision really isn't a decision at all, right? Kicking an extra point would make it a seven point game, another touchdown and near automatic extra point away from tying it up. Believe it or not, the math disagrees. After cutting the deficit to eight points late in the game, the smart decision is actually to go for two and either face an eight point or six point deficit. How is this the case? Well, it's pretty simple and it's a matter of win percentage. Falcons fans know what I'm talking about. It's those graphs that look like an EKG. If you're down 14 in the fourth quarter with around three or four possessions left in the game, you're not likely to win regardless of what you do. But going for two can increase your win probability from 11.3% to 18.3, assuming both plays are successful. The difference in added win percentage between a successful two point conversion and a successful extra point is greater than the loss win percentage between an unsuccessful two point conversion and a successful extra point. Put simply, the reward outweighs the risk. Overall, the difference between simply going for two and going for one is a difference of 12.9 win percentage and 11.2 win percentage. It's not a lot, but if you can increase your odds of winning by 1.7%, you would do it every time, right? Especially when you're losing. It also comes down to the fact that you have multiple possessions remaining and the fact that the odds of converting one two-point conversion are greater than the odds of failing to convert a two-point conversion twice. And in other situations, unlike the other dilemmas here, going for two actually has a defined rule set. Assuming there are three possessions left in a game, you should always go for two when you're down 10, eight, five, or two points. You should also go for it if you're up by one, two, four, or five. Anything above that and it's better to play it safe and take the extra point. But there's an even bigger question. Would an NFL team be better off if they just went for two every single time, never kicking an extra point? If a two point conversion is successful 48% of the time and an extra point is successful 94% of the time, well, the math is easy. Let's take a thousand touchdowns. If you go for two every single time, the odds say you'd be successful 480 times out of a thousand. If you kick the extra point every time, it'll be good 940 times out of a thousand. Going for two gets you 960 points. Kicking an extra point every time will get you 940 points. So up to a certain point, it makes mathematical sense to go for two every time. There is, however, a flaw in this math. Teams don't score a thousand touchdowns per season. So you won't see the numbers even out like you would in an equation with an unlimited sample size. In 2020, the Green Bay Packers scored 66 touchdowns, the most in the league. If you reduce a fourth of those touchdowns to account for just the first three quarters of a game, you're only looking at about 50 touchdowns where you can put the two point conversion math to the test. There's also another flaw because of how games shake out in the fourth quarter. We will never see an NFL where the extra point is made totally obsolete. The most obvious example would be scoring a game tying touchdown time expires. At that point, you would be an imbecile to go for two rather than kick an extra point and win the game. The small sample size plus the slim profit margin if you convert the average 48% of your two pointers could make a coach look bad if the experiment doesn't pay off. However, for a coach with a guaranteed 10 year contract, it may make sense to go for two every time in the first three quarters of a game. But coaches live on the hot seat and the conservative option won't get you criticized and won't lose you your job, unless they get a hold of your emails.
Analytics are robust and can help guide coaches to make the right decision, but there are a few things to keep in mind when it comes to the math. First off, decision making is about the process over the result. If the process is right, Sixers fans, then more often than not, the results will follow, not Sixers fans. But the right decision on any given occasion does not guarantee a positive outcome. That doesn't mean a coach was dumb to go for it on fourth and three from the 50 yard line. But if they do it enough, success will follow more often than not. Final point, analytics are a tool in the decision-making process, not the end-all, be-all. Holy shit, I sound like Joe Judge. The analytics is just a tool. It's nice to look at the numbers and how they go through the flow of the game, but the analytics changes based on the opponent, based on who you have available for the game, and how the flow of the game is going, too. It's one piece of the puzzle. There are other factors at play that only a coach can be aware of. The math may tell you to kick a 55-yard field goal on 4th and 20. But a coach may not have the confidence in his kicker or know that he has a slight injury hampering his range, Rodrigo. Or weather could be a factor, or it's the Lions. So the next time you see your team punt inside enemy territory and your team loses, it's okay to call your coach a cowardly bitch. Because mathematically, he is. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope it didn't confuse you too much. But subscribe, like, and comment for more interesting films on sports. I'm Five Points Vids, and you made it to my next video.